We've done like 150 or somewhat, I don't know how many episodes of this show, and we've never really talked about the Manichaeans. Tonight, we're going to reconcile that, and uh, we're going to cover a topic that has been long absent from our show, so stay tuned. Hello, everybody. I'm Father Tony Silvia, and joining me, my co-host back from his long Siberian uh, winter vacation, is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. Hello, everybody. How was your uh, your holiday break? My holiday break was great. My uh, my secret mission, uh, <laughs> as I talked about in the last show, went well as uh, uh, as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, the pump for for 2016. Fantastic. So we've got a great show lined up. We're going to talk about the Manichaeans, and since neither of us really know very much about the Manichaeans, we brought in an expert. We've brought in Dr. Timothy Pettipiece of the University of Ottawa. Welcome, Timothy. Hello. Thanks for Thank joining. Thank you for having me. Uh, that's great. Now we're we're going to get into some uh, discussion of the Manichaeans here, but uh, to start off with, let's just uh, you know the basics. Wh what did, what were the Manichaeans talking about? What did they do? And what did they believe? And and uh, you know, just an easy question to start off with. <laughs> yeah, just sum, sum that yes. up as easy <laughs> as possible. <laughs> well, in, in a nutshell, the Manichaean movement started in third century Persia and is founded by a Aramaic speaking prophet named Mani. Thus the, uh, he's the namesake for the movement. And he made a rather remarkable claim that he was the last in a series of prophets, uh, which included Zoroaster, Buddha and Jesus. So he had this very inclusive uh, view of prophetic history uh, and he sought to replace all existing religious traditions with his own very dualistic vision of a cosmic struggle between light and darkness uh, in which human beings are the central players uh, so he elaborated this very complex mythology of a creation story of how light and darkness came into conflict um, and then explained how that this conflict would be resolved if his followers engaged in certain dietary rituals, uh, eating particular foods that would liberate the light from the its imprisonment in the darkness. And that's a pretty uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, that I would say would be one of the main differences uh, between Gnosticism, uh, specifically the way we've been talking about it, and Manichaeanism, right? That, that strict duality between the light and dark. Can you explain a little bit more about the, the light and dark principles in Manichaeanism? Yes, well, they, they have a, a very distinct dualism. It's not uh, what we would call a platonic dualism, which is more of what you find in Gnostic texts, which is the opposition of spirit and matter. Uh, in Manichaean thinking, both light and darkness are substances. There's a, it's a very materialistic uh, ideology. Uh, and so these substances are what become combined in the cosmic struggle and then have to be sort of extracted through these uh, ritual uh, protocols. Um, but I, I think another key difference with the, the Gnostic cosmogony or creation story is the fact that it's the, the powers of light that build the cosmos as a kind of distillation factory to extract the, the light that has been imprisoned. Uh, whereas in, say, the Sethian mythology, uh, the cosmos is a product of the dark powers who who design it as a, as a prison. No, yeah, that's interesting. So the, uh, the creation of the world is, uh, is a kind of alchemical process. Although maybe yeah, they wouldn't a, use that word. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Petapiece, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Dr. Petapiece, this, uh, 
this this movement, um, uh, I've heard that it, was, it became very, very large. I've heard it labeled as, as the first international religion. Is that true? Was it, was it a sizable uh, movement? It's, it's hard to say. I, I don't think... Uh, I mean, it's certainly well attested. We find traces of Manichaeans really all over the place, uh, especially in late antiquity and into the Middle Ages. Uh, I don't think their membership numbers were ever uh, very huge, um, and they probably appealed to more of a economic elite. It's often uh, seen to be a religion of merchants, either in Egypt or in Central Asia, uh, and the people who promote the religion are usually uh, highly literate and, and sometimes sophisticated, so it probably uh, was never a populist movement, um, but we have evidence of Manichaean activity in many parts of the Roman Empire and then as far distant as Central Asia and China over about a thousand years. So it certainly is um, and was designed to be a universal, what we might call a world religion. So uh, that in itself is pretty remarkable. You mentioned that they, um, that they referenced uh, earlier prophets. Um, what, <clears throat> yes. What was their feeling on the, those earlier prophets as compared to the prophet Mani? Did they feel like that was kind of, those were imperfect revelations and, and Mani kind of cleared it all up for them? That's the basic idea. Uh, Manny was convinced that the earlier prophets, um, they intended, they had the true revelation to deliver. They were authentic messengers, but for him, the problem was they didn't write their revelation down, uh, but their teaching, in his view, was misinterpreted uh, mm. by their followers, so he tried to rectify this by actually composing his own scriptures um, for his own particular movement. Oh, that's interesting, like the religious telephone game. <laughs> right, right. He tried to circumvent that, uh, that problem. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So Manny uh, obviously was, uh, was an educated man then if he, if he could write these things down himself. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Manny. What do we know about him? Well, we have uh, quite a bit of information, but it's hard to pin down uh, any concrete facts um, and, and to peel back the, the hagiography that surrounds a lot of this uh, information. Uh, we know that he was born in the early 3rd century um, and that his parents were part of the Parthian nobility, which was a Iranian group that came to power after the Hellenistic period. Um, but this was a time when this Parthian nobility was being superseded by a, a new regime, the Sasanian uh, dynasty in, in Persia. So there's a lot of political upheaval uh, in, the year, in his early years. His mother seems to either die or disappear from the narrative early on. And his father takes him to live in this obscure baptizing sect in Mesopotamia known as the Alkazites. Um, and he lives there uh, during his childhood and youth. And at a, in his, uh, as a child, he begins to have visions uh, delivered to him by this figure known as his celestial twin. Uh, and because of these visions, he ends up in conflict uh, with the baptizing community and ultimately breaks uh, from this community and, and leaves them with great animosity. Um, and then goes on a series of journeys to Eastern Iran and to India. Uh, and afterwards he returns to Persia and begins his career as a religious teacher, uh, getting permission from the Persian King Shapur to travel the empire and spread his message. And he does this for several years and, and founds communities and sends out missionaries 
uh, and composes his scriptures. But when Shapur dies, his imperial patron, the, the king's successors, uh, withdraw their support, uh, largely from pressure of the Zoroastrian priesthood, and he's imprisoned and executed around the year uh, 277. Um, and his followers then continue uh, spreading uh, the message in his name, both east and west. Very interesting story. Jonathan, were you going to say something? I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, so to, to kind of sum up Manny's influence, he's, um, he, he does seem to be familiar with Buddhism and Zoroastrianism and Christianity and perhaps, you know, the groups that we sometimes call the Gnostics, like Sethi and Valentinians. Is he, does he seem to be familiar with all this material? Is he combining it together in a new and interesting way? Or do some of these influences come in later? That's, that's an important question, and it's, and it's not uh, entirely clear. Um, the irony is that even though Manny went to such great trouble to write his own scriptures, almost none of those scriptures has survived, have survived. Uh, so the texts we have are later uh, versions and interpretations of, of Manichaean teaching. Um, and, I, and I think the, the basis of his uh, theology is rooted in a certain type of kind of heterodox uh, Christianity. Uh, and and he's, he probably inherits a, a, a dualistic outlook from the sort of local Persian environment. Um, but we don't really know how much he knows about other religions like Buddhism and, and, and Zoroastrianism. We don't really know what those religions looked like at the time uh, in the third century. So it's hard to um, attribute the influence of uh, another tradition when we don't really have a solid picture of how that tradition was manifested uh, in his particular context. But he certainly, you know, existed in, in a multi-religious society and was uh, open to influences that weren't available to, say, other Christians in, in, on the Roman side of the border. So it makes, a very, makes for a very unique uh, environment and outlook. Mm -hmm. What an interesting part of the world that was with all of the various religious traditions all coming together. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, before we wrap up our video portion and go on to the podcast, I want to tease a couple of things for the viewers that we're going to be talking about during the podcast. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the, uh, the comparisons between uh, the Manichaean religion and some of the other religious traditions that existed at the same time. Um, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about the Secret Book of John, one of my favorite Gnostic texts, and, uh, and, and we're going to discuss what happened to the Manichaeans, uh, all coming up on the podcast. But uh, before we go on to, to record that, if somebody were interested in getting to know the Manichaeans uh, and they didn't have a lot of experience with them, are, are there any books or websites or resources you might recommend to them? Yes, yeah, certainly. There's a, there's a classic um, book by the great French scholar Michel Tardieu um, that came out in the early 80s, uh, that, written in French, but the uh, English translation was recently published, uh, and that's, that's probably the best, uh, one of the best introductions. Uh, an another recent uh, introductory text is by a, a British uh, academic, Nicholas Baker Bryan. Um, that, that is also a good place to start. All right. Very good. Um, great. So uh, where can people find you on the Internet if they want to find out about your work and uh, the scholarly work that you're doing on the subject? Yeah, so the, probably the best place is uh, academia.edu, which is now the sort of Right. Facebook for <laughs> academics that I have a profile there, uh, Timothy Pettipis, that can be searched. Uh, and that has a pretty up-to-date list of, of publications and scholarly activities. That's, that's probably the best resource. 
All right, fantastic. Well, we will link that in the description of the show here for everybody to go check out. Great. All righty. So then let's wrap things up here and move on to a recording of the podcast, which will be released uh, shortly after this video uh, version of the show comes out. And uh, I have no specific news to mention. Do you have anything, Jonathan? No, I, I don't think I do. All right. So, so absolutely nothing happening. Everybody, absolutely nothing happening except, you know, share the show, listen to the show, subscribe to the show, check out our <laughs> Patreon. That's that's yeah. all I got. All those, all those typical end of the show things. All right, everybody. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who are watching us along at home, we will see you next week. Good night. <laughs>